I'm Robert Burney. I'm one of the finance professors here at Coastal. And what I was going to do today is talk about finance, the profession, and the, uh, and the major here at Coastal. So I know a lot of you all, I've, I hinted out a couple of these, but I know a lot of you all already are familiar with the uh, very fast internet connection today, huh? Yeah, the Wall Street Journal, right? Okay, so you know the Wall Street Journal is, uh, is a business newspaper, but it's real heavy on finance. Of course, finance is an important part of business, yeah? But I, uh, there's, uh, how many of you all have seen this journal before? How many of you read it on a regular basis? Nobody, okay, Just all right. Just the stock part. Just the stock part. <coughs> okay, so this is, this is one of the things I should start off by mentioning. Regardless of what your, what your area, what your profession is, particularly in business, you need to be kind of plugged into what the big events are of the day, right? The trends that are going on. And everybody's really busy. Everybody's really busy, but everybody's got enough time to pick up some relevant information during the day. You're traveling in your car. You may have satellite, uh, satellite radio. Yeah, You listen to the business news. Or if you get the newspaper. If you don't get the newspaper, you know the websites. They've always got the headlines. And when I tell people who are in business, they, uh, you ought to know most of what's on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, If you, if you know what's going on there, the big headline stories, you'll probably be okay. But yeah, the, uh, the, the market data, the, the interest rate data, the foreign exchange data, all that sort of stuff, I'm typically watching that all the time. And I'm a busy fellow too, although it doesn't look like it. What I do is I tend to put the Wall Street Journal as my home page at my office, and then at home, my home page is the Financial Times of London, right? So basically, every time I go online, I get hit in the face with the headline news. You with me? What's your home page? <laughs> okay, there you go. It's good, pretty good too. But this is the thing, one thing's gonna happen, your life's gonna keep getting busier and busier, but you gotta stay informed. So think about ways that you can stay informed about business relevant news. And I think using the, using the, the websites of these types of organizations, could somebody wake him up, please? I'm worried about it. If he passes out completely, yeah? All right, so you've got to find, you got to find some sort of way to stay informed. It's got to be painless. If it's painful, you're not going to do it, right? So what do you listen to, what do you listen to in the car when you're driving? And it's all new stuff, right? Okay, all right. There you go. That's excellent, too. This is a neat thing about the, about the satellite, the, you know, the satellite radio. You get anything, right? I actually was listening to Polish news the other day, in English, but you know, Polish news. It's pretty interesting, but the point is you gotta learn how to stay informed without giving up a whole bunch of your life. You're already in the car, right? You're already gonna log on. Think about those sorts of things, right? Even if you don't read the papers cover to cover, at least know what's going on. All right, so we need to start talking about finance. What's finance? Everybody knows something about finance. We, we like to describe it as the, the science and art of managing money. You know, we live in a society that's based on a free market economic system. You're aware of that, right? And so most everything that happens about allocating resources and cost benefit, it's all, it's all communicated in terms of money. Is that right? No? So money's at the, at the center of enterprise. So almost any business transactions you do, any interaction in business that you do is going to have money involved, right? So finance is the specialization dealing with that. We divide the profession of finance typically into three main areas, financial management, investments, and banking. And we'll talk about each of those in turn. Well, of course, here at Coastal, right, we have specializations in each of those, uh, each of those areas. So in the finance major at Coastal, we've got, we call them tracks. The university calls them specialty areas. We call them tracks. So when you hear the finance majors and the finance professors talking about the tracks, that's what we're saying, these different paths you can take. So we've got an investments track, specializing on the investments. Uh, financial management track, and then banking and consumer finance. So the different, the things that a person would do in investments, it already tells the story. It's stocks and bonds, retirement planning, that sort of financial services. And that track prepares someone for a, a career in those areas. Financial management sounds just like its name. It's the day-to-day -day financial management of, of corporations and other businesses. And then the banking and consumer finance this is probably the thing uh, that most uh, is most familiar to you in terms of the world of finance because you interact with the bank, you got your credit card and all that sort of stuff. But what I've done is I found a couple of videos because I figured you'd want to see videos instead of hearing me talk, right? <laughs> so what these are, are these, not, uh, they're all on YouTube so you can look at them later if you want to. They're kind of like a day in the life of. Have you seen those sort of videos before? Day in the life of a cowboy? You did? You liked that one? You didn't like that one. The a day in the life of a NASCAR driver. Okay, so these are these are basically like that. So I'm dim dim the lights and we'll we'll take a look. Hopefully that my links are working good today. And then these uh, these are these videos are designed to give you kind of that's not too dark. 
These are designed to give you an idea of kind of what it's like to be a finance professional working in these areas. So I'll show you these, we'll talk about them a little bit, and then we'll come back and talk about the major. Financial managers follow the money. Their titles and responsibilities vary, but almost every business relies on them working alone or as part of a team to protect the company's bottom line. The skills involved in guiding the flow of money through a corporation are considered so vital to its success that these executives often attain the top ranks of company management. A chief financial officer, or CFO, is usually a firm's top fiscal expert, formulating financial plans and policies and overseeing activities such as mergers and acquisitions, the preparation of reports and forecasts, and all financial and accounting functions. Other financial management titles include controllers who oversee the preparation of financial reports and analyze future earnings and expenses. Controllers might also direct accounting, audit, and budget departments. Treasurers and finance officers are responsible for a company's financial goals, objectives, and budgets. They might also supervise investments and cash management. Cash managers might fill that role in larger companies. Risk and insurance managers handle programs to help reduce the company's exposure to losses. Credit managers work to make sure the company extends credit wisely. All these and other financial managers work together as a team in large corporations. In smaller companies, one or more individuals might cover all of these duties. A company of any size depends on the advice of financial managers when key decisions are made. Most financial managers have earned advanced degrees and professional certifications and continue their training on the job. All are comfortable with computers and the latest financial software. Different industries require additional expertise, whether it's understanding the expenses involved in running a sports franchise or medical costs in the healthcare field. Multinational firms often require fluency in a foreign language. The hours can be long and some travel is standard. There can be a great deal of stress even when the company is doing well. But along with financial rewards comes the satisfaction of contributing to a company's success. Okay, so one thing they mentioned there is something you should keep in mind. The, the finances of the company are so important that finance is always in the center of the big decisions, right? So regardless of what, the, what strategic decision making is going on, there's always going to be a finance side to it. So what they were saying was lots of times when you get to the top, the top of corporations, the C-suite group, right? That group, lots of times you talk about the CEO, lots of them have a, a finance and accounting background because you've got to have it in order to oversee the company. So this is, this is one thing that was mentioned. I don't want to oversell our, uh, our major in finance, but it's true that CEOs have to know a lot of finance, whether they were finance majors or whether they learned it on the job. Okay, so you saw that, the, uh, the, the, the general nature of the, the work experience for someone in corporate finance or financial management. The one, that doesn't get as much play in the movies and whatnot, but uh, the investments sure do, right? Because investments are flashy if you want a generic, highly paid, exciting sort of career it's in the movies is almost always investments but the truth of the matter is depending on the tranche it can be really it can be very it can be very close to what the movies have so this is a this is a day in the life couple of brokers one's in london and one's in new york yeah Half the reason I think I enjoy London so much is because of the job. Yeah, it's great life. I mean, it's fast paced. It's exactly the sort of lifestyle that I like to lead. Well, I'm from New York and I love New York. It's a land of opportunity. I'm usually up at six o'clock. Come out of my apartment and usually hail a taxi. I'm out the door by 10 past six. You hop on the DLR in the morning and it's, uh, it's quiet. I find out quite a few people out that early morning. This is the city that never sleeps. I'll read the times on the, uh, on the way in the morning and see if there's any sort of issues happening in our particular market. I come in the office about five to seven most mornings. I sit down at the desk and open up my terminal and, and start chatting to a few clients. And then it's go, really. At times, it can be busy the whole day, it can be slow the whole day. You know, that's the whole thing with the markets, you never know. Our clients are in investment banks, and um, basically what we do is we, we, we try to, to gather information, we know who's got what, and uh, we know who wants what. You're done, you're done, I'm still bent. And we try to 
try and match these two up. It's like a jigsaw puzzle, putting the pieces together. Uh, I suppose in a sense we're matchmakers. The major difference between what we do as brokers and, and sort of investment banking or trading is risk. If you're on the investment banking side, take it home, your whole position, still thinking about it. We take very little risk um, home with us. We don't take positions. Well, I leave at the end of the day. That's it. On to the next day, let's go. Yeah, risk is probably one of the larger differences between ICAP's broken world and uh, investment banking. It's more demand in here, but it's a more relaxed demand. Here. There are periods throughout the whole day that are a little bit quieter than others. Then in those periods, you sort of talk to each other and try and create business. 21 and a half feet, mate. 21 and a half feet. On my desk, we've got six uh, guys, and we all work as a, uh, as a team. We all have roughly about six or seven clients each, so our communication on the desk has to be high. I can actually cover six accounts, and that's pretty big, you know, so it gets pretty intense, two phones to the head, but you, uh, you get to talk about a lot. You spend eight hours with the guys, you know, eight, nine hours with the guys, you get to know them well, you know. It actually feels like a little small family. Everybody's on one level, so we seem to work all together on one accord, which I like a lot. It's like, we're here to do our job, let's do it. Come about 12 o'clock, that's where everyone sort of takes a break. We try and be back on the desk when the U.S. market opens. If it's opened up significantly, either higher or lower, then yeah, it can kick off and, uh, and we can, that's our afternoon started, which is great. Three and three quarter minutes past the mile. I think at first, you know, the shouting definitely gives you like, the price scary, like, what's going on here? Uh, but as time goes on, you get used to it, it becomes like second nature to you. You even yell yourself. We do work very hard, but uh, there are times, obviously, where you can have a bit of a laugh and a bit of a joke about, and which, you know, makes our desk a little more fun. But if you're making money, nobody seems to bother. It's not all done in working hours, obviously. There is a lot of uh, entertaining to be done outside of the office. I love playing basketball. Um, I even have customers actually love to play basketball and uh, we try to get up there and play. Um, you forge those relationships over time, whether that be over, uh, over a dinner or socially it's out having a drink. I'm out with at least one client, at least, you know, definitely at least once a week, you know. Sometimes I can be out like three times in a week, you know. Because you become friendly with these guys, and therefore you don't need to talk about work the whole time. And a lot of the time, when you're out with them, you don't even bring up the subject. It is much more relaxed. I mean, you do talk a little bit about business and like how you can improve business and what can I do more. But you do, it is like a downtime, you know, for them. The better you get to know the client, obviously, the more they trust you, and therefore the more information they're willing to give you. And if you do the correct trade for them, if you get things done for them, they make money, you make money. Um, that's how your relationships are built up. It becomes a friendship. You definitely need to be driven. You need to be team spirited. You need to be very energetic. And innovative, I mean, again, you've got to come up with ideas for, for your traders. You gotta also be enthusiastic, you know. You gotta be wanting to do it, you know. You gotta have the drive to actually want to do the job and know that, send that off to your customer, knowing that you, you're gonna do the best thing for him. I wouldn't have dreamt of doing this, you know, three or four years ago. It's something that sort of, uh, the opportunity arose and I, I grabbed it with both hands and it seems to have worked out really well. So it's definitely a great career. Okay, all right, so kind of capture day. That, of course, you got to understand, those guys are playing in the big leagues, right? So in the majors, it's a little bit more stressful and you know, the, smaller, the smaller outfits, right? But one, one problem with that, uh, that level of play, of that particular specialization, is it's really high stress. You could see it was a pretty high stress day, right? And those, those sorts of positions, people have a lot of fun, they can make a lot of money, but they tend to burn out, right? So you'll have people that spend you know, 10 years, maybe 15 years in that, and then go into something else. Because did you notice how many old guys were in that room? You didn't, right? <laughs> this is a burnout thing. So it's like any other thing that's really intense. But in terms of investment management, wealth management, you, you can do it in big cities or you can do it in small towns, right? There's a lot of that here in, in the Myrtle Beach area because it's a retirement area and the retirement area tends to attract high net worth individuals that need those sort of services. Uh, this is pretty interesting. Did you notice one was in London, the other was in New York? 
Did everybody hear the part where he said, we try to be back at our desk in London when the markets open in New York? You heard that, right? Okay, so this is a global, uh, global financial marketplace, and in order to participate in it, you've got to recognize that's going on. Yeah? So there's more and more action in Asia now, and of course that's on the other side of the world, so the time's really off. Yeah? So uh, you, might, you might say, that sounds like great, we'll come back from lunch until you're the one that has to be there at 3 a.m. to be there when the next market opens. Yeah, So some big markets are open most of the 24-hour period, so somebody's got to be plugged in. Yeah? Can't have the market move on you. Yeah? So do you all know, you know a, a particular language you might want to be learning in terms of Chinese. Chinese? Mandarin Chinese, absolutely. Yeah, Spanish, ah, Spanish not so much in terms of the emerging markets, right? <coughs> but. Uh, yeah, German. Spanish is a good one. German, oh, sadly, no. Most of the German finance specialists speak English as well as we do, right? <laughs> yeah, you want to hurt yourself and you want to advance yourself, learn Mandarin. Most of you have already been online, seen some financial websites. Have you noticed how many of them have a link to Chinese versions of the website? Yeah, it's a huge number of new high net worth individuals in China, and uh, there are a lot of financial services for them. All right, so the next one is Banking. All right, so you already know a lot about banking because you've interacted with the bank. So we've got two here. The first one is a banker talking about the mindset of bankers and the kind of people who want to be in banking. And then the second one is talking about changes. So let's start with this one. Well, the banking industry has long been considered one of the world's most noble professions. It really is, it's a servant job. So you have to only take it if you're willing to serve other people and you feel good about changing lives. A college graduate has practiced for that very moment for all the years of their education. It's about business of people, for people, doing business with people, but it's business. And I think especially those who found some interest in the business areas, I think banking is the perfect place to practice your human skills and your technical skills and have the chance to do something to change people's lives. So it's not just, with all due respect to other industries, we're not just serving a product or serving a one need at a time, we're changing lives. And we can either be the place of safekeeping, where guidance and support is necessary, or the place where you have a dream, you want to share it with someone else who has the money, in this case the bank, and then enjoin with them to go forward and achieve that dream. So every day we wake up with the belief that we're making dreams come true. And in the last couple of years, I'm sorry to say, we've been helping dreams get protected and to keep them on track because of this difficult recession. But it's a place where you can practice everything you've been using for your whole life and bring it together for a vocation you can be proud of for a whole life. Just because you're a bank and you have a banking license doesn't mean you have an exclusive on banking. In the next generation of banking, we welcome Brett King, author of Bank 2.0. I talk about three phases in the book. So the first phase was the introduction of the internet. So this changed our transactional behavior. What internet banking gave us was new choices, new control. The psychology of that can't be underestimated. So as a bank, when we say to them, no, that doesn't work for us, you have to come down to the branch and sign a piece of paper, they say, are you crazy? This is the 21st century. We're under threat of losing the customer. If customers don't want to come into the branch, it's not that big a deal. We just serve them where they are. The banks complained to the Hong Kong Monetary Authority and said, you know what? Octopus is acting like a bank. They're deposit taking. We want you to stop them. HKMA looked at this situation and said, you know, you're absolutely right. They are acting like a bank. So we're going to give them a banking license. So we've got a lot of stuff occurring here that looks like banking, but isn't banking. What about your iPhone? What about your HTC or Android or Galaxy phones? These are now becoming a very important vehicle for accessing banking services. So who owns the customer? Consumer behaviour is ahead of the curve. If you aren't keeping up with these innovations, then someone else is going to innovate around you. I'm not sure that branches are necessarily the way to go. If I was building a new bank, 
uh, you know, mobile is, is growing extremely strongly as a banking platform. When we look at the integration of NFC or Near Field Contactless Communication Technology into the iPhone platform for the next generation of the iPhone, this is going to become our credit and debit card. Say I owe Barney $50. I put in $50. We touch our phones together, contactless to contactless. His phone just became a POS terminal. My phone just became a payment device. No card involved, no POS terminal involved. There might be a payments network involved, but that's the way we would choose to do the interaction. Why would I do that? Well, how simple is it? The banks aren't thinking about the journey the customer takes. The banks are thinking about the, the end of that journey, which is the transaction or the product, but they're not thinking how the customer gets to that end result. And when you start thinking about the journey the customer takes, that opens you up to some really great opportunities, and the web and mobile are obviously going to be key parts of that. What's happening in social media is this community aspect is working where you know, customers in this social network are saying, I trust my friends, I trust my network more than I trust what you're going to tell me about your brand. A lot of banks that I talk to say, oh, wait, hang on, hang on, we've got a Facebook page. We have a, we have a social media strategy. Bank of America has a Facebook page. I don't know how many millions of customers they've got, but they've got 1,929 fans on Facebook. It's pretty impressive. The only problem with this is that there's a group also called I Hate Bank of America and they have 3,200 fans on their Facebook page. So just having a Facebook page, I'm afraid, is not a social media strategy. If you think that brand marketing or you think marketing campaigns can prevent brand damage from this sort of thing, I'm sorry. We can't control what people are going to say or think about our brand. So this puts the onus back on us to demonstrate our brand. It's not about the technology. It's not about apps. It's not about CRM databases. It's not about these sorts of technologies, but it is about the behavior of customers. And if we understand behavior of customers, innovation is not only inevitable, but it's an absolute essential for the survival of your business. Okay, so he kind of referenced his book, so I guess if you want to <laughs> if you want to read more, that's a that's a nice book. But basically we're talking about changes in the way banks operate. And this is something I wanted to point out. So this this interface between financial services, traditional banking technology couple of trendy, trendy majors here. Right? Most people think of finance and marketing as very, very different, but actually the financial services industry right now is screaming for more people that are trained in both. Yeah? If you think about it, if you just have a marketing background, you're going to have a hard time really understanding how you sell financial services because you've got to understand the finance. And on the other hand, if you've concentrated four years on finance and only done a little bit of marketing, you're going to be ill-prepared to explore all these new ways of, of, of reaching customers. So the last couple of years, every single semester, we've got a couple of people that are double majoring in finance and marketing, and every single one of them is hired before they even finish their last semester. So the banking industry, financial services industry is really looking for people that have both backgrounds. So, and the other one, of course, is finance and computer science because the technology is completely changing. This, uh, the, world, the world is completely different because of the technology, but it's exactly the same because people are still doing the same things they were in the past. They're just doing it slightly different ways. So the, he mentioned CRM software. What's that? Do you know what that is? It's about managing relationships with customers, yeah? So most companies now, have dedicated software programs that keep track of what their, what their customers are doing. You know, if you've got a particular interaction with an online retailer and you go back, you know, sometimes they ask you, how'd you like your, th and then they mention your last purchase and so on, that sort of thing. But if you think about a bank, a bank's got all these different financial services that they're offering, and they need to keep track of where people are in their financial lives, how much savings they have, and so forth. So the other thing is there's a big trend, this big data. You've heard about that, right? The, 
there's been something of a revolution in the, in, in the recent years concerning how cheap it is to save data. And because it's so cheap, we're actually saving more data than we actually know what to do with. And there's starting to be companies, entire uh, industries that are built around that data. And that's the term we give that big data. So we've got transaction data, location data, likes, don't likes data, friend data, all that sort of stuff. But making some sort of sense in terms of what it means about what consumers want, whether or not they're happy and so forth. There's a, there's a big emerging field there and that combination of finance and computer science. That's a good, good double major there too. In the, in the first video, they mentioned professional certifications in finance. Most of you all have heard of at least one of these, the CPA. Yeah? But basically, uh, those who study finance and accounting, they study a body of knowledge. They get their degree. But then almost all of them will go on and get a professional certification. The professional certifications are additional credentials that aren't controlled by a university, but they're controlled by the industry group. And the industry group establishes a pretty rigorous exam that you have to study for and pass in order to get the designation. These are the big ones. Uh, the CFA and CFP are more in the investments area, the CMA, CFM, CPA to a certain extent in the corporate area. The, um, the banks uh, tend to have, an, have internal certifications, but not certifications that you earn independent of the banks. Yeah? But most, uh, most majors in finance are planning to take one or more of those, those certificates. And if you, if you get into that area, or finance or accounting, either one, you probably want to plan at least starting about halfway through your, your, your college career to be getting ready to take those exams. The best time to take the exam is right as you're finishing up your degree program when your knowledge is real crisp and you're ready to go. Yeah? Also, there's another big advantage. All of these uh, professional organizations cut students a break on the expense of studying and taking the exam. So if you've got an idea you might want to do one of those, for sure get into the programs before you, before you graduate. Here at Coastal, uh, finance tracks, uh, again, we mentioned there were three main areas. The finance tracks cover those three main areas in finance. Everybody takes the 301, 401, 402 sequence, kind of provides a, a, a general background. And then all students take specialty courses within the tracks. I just threw some examples up there. So if you were in corporate, you'd have to take multinational corporate finance, which is corporate finance with attention to the special issues of dealing in more than one currency and the risk that goes with that. The investments group fin does financial derivatives, stocks, auctions, futures, and so on. And then the banking group often will pick real estate finance because a lot of banking services has to do with mortgages and so on. The other thing about our program, we have a we have a capstone, we call it a capstone, or the, the last course in each of these tracks, the 490 sequences, 91, 92, and 93. Uh, each of those goes with a track, so depending on the track you pick. For example, in 491, that's the corporate finance or the financial management track. You get in there and we run a simulation where you have to manage a company. We do that in teams, you have to manage the company, you have to do the financial reporting, you have to do the financial analysis and all that. You gotta do the, the type of technical reporting that you would do in the actual workplace. So all of these courses are designed to kind of give you a feel for what it's like. So we practice presentations like you would to the board of directors or to investors in that course. Portfolio management, you'll do analysis, run portfolios and simulation. And of course, bank management, we build that one around a, a simulated bank that you have to manage. Yeah? So the idea with those capstone courses, we're trying to create a kind of like a transition course that helps you get ready for what it's really going to be like when you actually get into the workplace. But if you talk to the seniors that are in those courses, they're all going to be moaning because of the amount of work, right? Because we're taking it up to the level where it's really like what it's going to be like when you start working. So how we behave in class, the presentations, how we do the reporting, the reports and all of that is, is the way it would be if we were actually on the job. We have a, several students that have done multiple tracks. Of course, you've got to be really motivated to do that. <laughs> So a lot, of our, uh, a lot of our courses, the advanced courses, the, the capstone courses, we have them in wall 111. You all have seen the lab downstairs at the bottom of the big staircase. Yeah? So that's set up like a, like a trading room or a finance team room. Um, drop on by, have a look, preferably not during classes. Right? Sometimes you go by during class, you see everybody's got looking at both computer screens simultaneously and all that. So. But, uh, but yeah, you can come on by, see what it's like. The, uh, that's a, most, most of what I wanted to tell you today, so I guess I've got a little bit of time for some questions, if there are any. That's just a stretch, or is that a question, or is it a... 
Stretching question. No, it's a stretching question. Oh, okay. So All right. It's more like a, <clears throat> like a more male are into finance major or like. What? <laughs> more males. They're like, yeah. Yeah, no. Uh, like, like most of business. But I, let me answer the question more generally. Like most of business, right? A generation ago, it was male dominated, right? But now it's, it's quite a bit different. So in finance, you know, this, uh, those traders, the, the real aggressive brokers, that's, that's still kind of a male sport there. <laughs> but most other areas in finance are, are pretty much 50 50 now. Just like on the video, there were like more men in there. So on the what? On the, on the video that we watched on the, from England to. Uh, yeah, that's what I was saying, the brokers, right? The high level, scream all day type broker positions do tend to continue to be uh, male dominated, but then I don't know, maybe there's some male personality characteristics in that yelling, screaming, and highly competitive. But if you remember the other two, right, the other two, you know, no. The, particularly in the corporate finance, it's actually probably, it's probably going 50-50 right now, yeah. And then banking, I mean, y'all interact with the banking community, so you know. I only asked that question because I saw that on the video from London to New York. Yeah, no, but, but that is true. But it's, it's kind of a loud, yelling, kind of aggressive environment, and it, not, e not even all males are attracted to that, you know. Yes, sir. Uh, which one of these tracks, you know, has to do with um, like financial planning, like it help, like who would, which track would you take if you want to be the person that people come to to find out how much they need to retire or whatnot? Yeah, that would be the investments track. Okay. We we call it the wealth management track, but everybody else just says investments. But yeah, so there's uh, that covers those high-powered brokers, like institutional brokers, but also the brokers that serve individuals, like you're talking about uh, financial planning. Uh, yeah, and that's the, the financial planning, the retail level investment management and retirement planning, that's, that's something that's done in every single town. And so here in Myrtle Beach, I think this area uh, where you can, you can look at it, uh, you can kind of get an si uh, idea of the size of the, that sector by the number of certification holders that are in place. So the CFP or Certified Financial Planner is the certification that those people would work for. Not all of them would get it, but they'd work for. In our area, in the Myrtle Beach area, I think there are 35 or 36 people that have CFPs, right? And that's probably on, I don't know, a tenth of the people that are in the area because it's hard to get the CFP. On the other hand, if you look at CFAs, and that's chartered financial analysts like those, those high-octane brokers would get, there's not but two or three of them in, in town, right? Two of them are in the building, <laughs> right? So the, uh, the, the concentration is such that S some things are, are those high high power broker things, those type of positions. They're always going to be in big cities, but in terms of financial services, it's it's everywhere. Every small town, in um, the what you, what you're talking about, that that would definitely be the investments track. Were you ever in any of the tracks, or you just a professor? Was I ever in any of the tracks? Do you mean did I work in the tracks, yeah, or did? Oh, okay. Well, yeah, no, I, I, came to, I came to Coastal right after I finished my Ph.D. I have a Ph.D. in finance, but I've got uh, the CMA. So I'm a certified management accountant and also a certified financial uh, manager, so I'm a CMA CFM. Uh, like I said, I went straight through, came from my Ph.D. program to Coastal, but I work, uh, I work as a financial consultant, and I'm also on the board of directors. I'm the treasurer of Carolina Trust, so, so I worked in the banking the, the banking sector, and then as a consultant, probably more in what you'd call investment banking. Okay. So yeah, it's a... Uh, we learned about the, uh, the, the CMA and the CPA uh, in the accounting presentation. Mm -hmm. We learned about, uh, specifically the CPA, about uh, the continuing education that's required, the credits and things like that. In the other certifications, are there other similar things where you have to stay current in order to keep your certification? Yes, yes. All of those, uh, all of those certifications are run by a professional, uh, a professional association or organization that's goal is to uh, make sure that their members are uh, professionally competent. And because the world's changing, the body of knowledge is changing. So all of them have some sort of continuing education requirement. Uh, depending on the certification, it might be you know, extensive. It might be stuff you can do on your own. In some cases, you've got to go to seminars and so forth. But the idea here is to keep you learning during your entire life. The world's changing. You've seen that already in your lives. 
And in order to become, or in order to make sure that you don't become irrelevant, you're going to have to be learning your entire life. This is the scary thing. You finish your college degree, you're probably going to study more after than in college, but it'll be more related to the stuff you're doing on a daily basis. So this is one of the really neat things about the certifications. Once you get one of those certificates, it's tough to get, right? You've heard the people talking about taking the CPA exam, the CFA exam, CMA exam. Oh, it's tough to pass it. And lots of people take it two or three times before they pass it. Once you get it, you don't want to lose it. And if you don't do the continuing education, the organizations will yank that certificate from you. And it's like a, a real strong incentive not to lose your certificates. So that kind of makes you keep studying. And so it ensures that you'll have this uh, up-to-date skill set that you'll need in the workplace. As you know, we're all lazy, right? You got to have some sort of threat to keep you pushing hard, right? Some sort of incentive. And so, yeah, I think it's a really good idea. I would. Uh, I would say that the most important reason for getting one of those certificates is not for the differentiation that it gives your resume, but the fact that it'll draw you into this lifelong continuing education process focused on your career that'll make sure that you stay relevant, competent, and up to date. And that's what's necessary if you're going to have a successful career. Somebody just finishes their college degree, never studies anything else, and never ever learns anything more they're not going to go very far in their career because the career is going to change out from under them. But yeah, so that's, uh, I mentioned before, a lot of these organizations provide a, a, an incentive for you to join while you're a student. And if, you've, if you think you'd be interested in, we can give you links to all of these. Most of these organizations have, have some sort of presence, direct or indirect, on campus in the student body. Uh, we could help you get uh, hooked up with one. But yeah, it's. Uh, it's, very, it's, a, it's a very strong signal to a potential employer if you're in one of these tracks and you've already started, like you've joined one of these organizations and you've already started trying to get that certification. That's a really strong signal. Because right? again, how many people are going to push that hard when they're still an undergrad? The answer, no more than 10%. So if you're one of the 10%, you really stand out. Any other questions? Well, there you go. All right. So. If, you've any, if you have any questions, you drop by the finance, uh, you know, the finance department. We've got a finance club on campus, right? It's, uh, we can put you in touch with them, uh, do some interesting trips from time to time, have a lot of interesting speakers come in. But yeah, if you want more information, again, my name's Robert Burney, B-U-R-N-E-Y. I'm on the second floor down on the other end of the building. Just drop in. But if you drop in the department, anybody can help you get in touch with the student club or learn more about any of these things. So. Is that it? Okay.